So thanks for coming to this session. It's my honor to kick us off here. Um, I'm Marty, and I think this is my sixth NASIS. Oh, thanks. So my focus in cartography is on stemming these three interwoven crises, climate extinction and inequitable access to nature and all its benefits. And I had the honor of covering these topics for National Geographic's cover story last month, America the Beautiful, which is all about the future of conservation in the US. And today I'm gonna to share with you the story that we decided to tell in two maps and one of the design challenges I had to solve along the way. And I'm hoping to leave a few minutes for questions, so think of your questions. Before I dive in, I'd like to thank Martin Gamash for asking me to do this project, as well as Matt Schwastik and Monica Serrano, who were fantastic editors, and Travis Belote, who was my primary scientific advisor on this. So the core idea I wanted readers to take away was that the future of conservation is about improving our relationships with nature everywhere and getting creative in how we do it, embracing not just traditional protected areas, but all kinds of stewardship in cities, on farms, public lands, private lands, places where people recreate and places where people live and work. I wanted to present a vision that everyone could see themselves in. And while this piece is forward looking, it was important to me that it not be prescriptive about what ought to happen where. Um, good and just conservation is community led, not top down. And there are many, many different ways to be good stewards. So instead of being prescriptive, I wanted to equip people with information they could really use to be advocates in their communities and to evaluate any proposals that they may encounter. So this is the first map I'm going to share. Um, it's big, so I'm going to zoom in and go piece by piece. So you may have heard that the US has joined over 90 other countries in a pledge to protect 30% of Earth's land and water by 2030, which is really soon. Um, and the big question that most people ask when they hear that is, which 30%? And there really are a million ways to think about this, um, but we decided to explore four key values straight from the original 2019 Global Deal for Nature paper, uh, where an international team of scientists first proposed the 30% by 2030 goal. So we wanted to know, where are the top 30% most important places for providing clean drinking water, saving wildlife, preserving ecosystem diversity, and trapping carbon? And how much of those areas is already protected? So here's what that looks like in the lower 48 for providing clean drinking water and saving wildlife. And here's what it looks like for preserving ecosystem diversity and trapping carbon. So as it turns out, different parts of the country light up for each. Key conservation values actually overlap geographically much less than most people expect. These four maps, representing the top 30% of each of these values, overlap in less than 2% of the country. So we know that different places are important for different things. And in fact, when we combine them all on one map, they cover the whole country. So even just with these four values, we see that everywhere really is important for something. And not only that, but everywhere is in the top 30% most important for something. And that's every single county. I triple checked. So we also have points on this map for the top 30 large cities most in need of more equitable park access. Uh, this is using the Trust for Public Lands Park Equity or Park Score, uh, which I think is actually being discussed in another session right now. So you, uh, you can see there's a cluster of them in Southern California. In the notes around the map, we highlight some of the most innovative community-led and particularly BIPOC-led conservation efforts underway in rural and urban settings and on public and private lands across the country. 
a collection really representing the kind of diversity of efforts that we need. So there's a lot more I could talk about on this map, but I'll move on to the second one. So here we go to the continental scale. Wildlife need a connected network of natural areas so that they can move and track shifting climate conditions. Without connectivity, they face extinction. So it's important to conserve the connections that remain and restore them where they've been lost. How do we know where those are? I'll zoom in. So this map shows modeled flow of wildlife. Then the analysis behind it uses circuit theory, so how electrons move across a resistant surface, to predict how terrestrial wildlife move across the continent, where electrons represent animals and uh, the resistant surface is the naturalness of the landscape. So more natural areas offer less resistance and highly human modified places offer high resistance. The, so in the dark areas on this map, flow of wildlife is low. These are the places where human development like cities or intensive agriculture or even natural barriers like large bodies of water uh, make it generally risky or impossible for, wild, for terrestrial wildlife to travel. And the areas in the mid-tones, especially further north, um, these are the places where, um, where flow of wildlife is moderate and diffuse. So these are, the, these are really the big wild places where um, animals can spread out and roam rather freely, um, and no one path is particularly critical. And the brightest areas on this map are where flow is the highest, so where animals on the move are concentrated into corridors because of surrounding development pressures. And so those are the critical linkages that are at risk of being cut off by habitat fragmentation and nature loss. And we point out examples of promoting connectivity, so ranging from large-scale corridor work like the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative um, to my personal favorite, Vermont, where volunteer crossing guards escort frogs and salamanders across roads at night during their springtime migrations. And so the biggest challenge with this map was that this is a really new concept for most people. Um, even for folks who have been working on connectivity for a long time, this model can be hard to wrap your head around at first. Uh, so we had to do a lot to make it understandable. And a big part of that was color. So some requirements. Since, since connectivity is not an established concept in most people's minds, I wanted to choose a color scheme that would evoke a similar established concept that might make connectivity more understandable. I figured out pretty quickly that these data require a multi-hue color ramp um, in order to tease out the nuance and values that we wanted to show. A lot of multi-hue color ramps are pretty psychedelic, um, and these data are already pretty psychedelic no matter what color you use, so I had to keep that in check. And greens were a no-go. Um, people already have too many preconceived notions of what green represents on a map like this, so it seemed more likely that green would mislead people. So here's where I started. Um, in, in my work, when we talk about connectivity uh, to people who are new to it, uh, when we talk about connectivity between habitats, we, we often use the analogy of veins and arteries connecting our vital organs and uh, people tend to really connect with that. They get it. So I got excited about using these colors um, and experimented with treating the values like elevations and giving them a hill shade so that they, these like vital connections had some definition to them. Um, but then I got some feedback that it looked like a crime scene, <laughs> which is not the vibe that we were going for. Uh, so went back to the drawing board. So the other analogy that we use when we talk about connectivity is that these connections are like highways for wildlife. They're the routes that connect all the different places where they need to go to live their lives, find a mate, and get what they need. And so when those routes are cut off, that causes problems for wildlife just like it does for us. And so I thought it might work to play off of photos of Earth at night 
um, which are familiar to a lot of people. But rather than the human pathways lighting up, it would be the wildlife pathways that light up. So if we were to put headlamps on all the wild animals walking around, uh, this map is what it might look like from space. Um, I made all of these in Dolly, the image generator, the AI image generator. Uh, really, really fun, highly recommend it. They did not make it into the magazine. <laughs> so both maps I shared today are on board number one in the map gallery looking small and lonely. Um, so if you want to go take a closer look, that's where you can find them. And in closing, I'd like to thank all the people who contributed to this piece, especially all of my sources who shared their knowledge and data with me, um, as well as the leaders of all the initiatives featured on the maps. Um, they are all doing fantastic work, and I appreciate them trusting me with it. And a big thank you to my editors and the whole team at National Geographic for believing in my ideas and contributing so much to this. And thank you all for listening and feel free to reach out anytime. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Do other states have things similar to that? Yeah, so there's, um, the USGS publishes the Protected Areas Database of the United States, the PADIS. They actually just came out with the latest update. Um, and that covers the whole country. It, um, it has some limitations that they acknowledge, um, especially in, I think, like the conservation easement uh, data is not complete. Um, but, it's, but it's pretty good. And like the latest version is def definitely a, a big improvement over, over the previous. Yeah, so if you Google like Pattis, I think it's version 3.1, 3.0? Yes. Yeah, one of those. It's, it's the first three, so. I think 3.1 is the next release. Okay, 3.0 then. Any other questions? Hi, I, I love the uh, presentation, so thank you very much. The, uh, the data, and if you said it, I'm sorry I missed it, for the circuit map. Um, that's pretty complicated data, and I'm sure it can't be answered quickly, but what was the general, what was the general source for that data? Yeah, so um, it was published this year, um, and the, the lead author is a scientist by the name of Travis Belote, um, who I've worked with for a long time. Um, I would be happy to send you the paper if you're interested. Um, but yeah, Belote et al., 2022. I can't remember the name of the journal that it came out in. <laughs> but it's actually built on a methodology established by Brad McRae, um, who I believe was at the University of Washington. Oh, we, we still have a couple minutes left for questions. Hey, Marty, a, an earlier version of this had a, an, a proposed inset over Los Angeles, and you had a very good reason for doing that. Would you mind sharing? Yes, sure. Thanks, Martin. Um, so, yeah, originally I wanted to have an inset, and L.A. was kind of the, the ideal one of, like, what does connectivity look like on a local scale? Um, and there's a lot of really cool connectivity work happening in L.A. right now. Um, especially, uh, I feel like mountain lions are kind of the classic example uh, that are used. So there's connectivity work to, to connect the, um, like the Santa Monica Mountains and like Griffith Park in LA, where there are, there's a mountain lion population, connect that to the surrounding uh, public lands and protected areas, both on the scale of like LA County, as well as connecting them. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, but you can see there's like a very sort of tenuous connection um, remaining between LA and really the rest of the West. And this is an, an area, Southern California has incredible biodiversity. Um, and if there's not some really conscious work done, you know, that's a, there's risk of cutting off those populations from the rest of the country. Great question. Thanks. 